part of what we're trying to impart through this program is really the importance of leadership and the understanding of what corporate leadership is about. So I use the P for pilotage or, you know, pilots are, uh, are leaders and uh, that, that is a significant component in the program. And time and time again, we're going to hear the significance and the importance of leadership in creating excellence. Quality management places a premium on people, you know. It's kind of ironic. In a lot of corporations, I think people spend more time thinking about the equipment than the people, you know. And quality management seems to indicate that people are the most important resource. Now, what decisions could I ask myself were made in the post office about future generations? We are about survival. You know, it was the government on our backs. They wanted to privatize us in the mid-90s, and we had to actually increase profit to the detriment of our staff and probably to the detriment of our customers. They are unable to solve equations with more than four or five variables non-linear with mathematical tools. It's impossible. So we must solve the problem with the systems view. The middle management is uh, very critical in a successful implementation of the system. The major uh, difficulty overcome the, the resistance. The most effective way is to get them involved. Different places have different definitions of quality. And the reason the definition varies is dependent upon the current understanding of what is TQM. It's widely varying from place to place. Current status of business and quality management practices. And finally, differences in socioeconomic conditions or environment in a particular society. And tonight, I'm going to just to be able to funnel down through the visionary leadership coming up the stream from the government itself, what I'm going to show you right now, how the visionary made Dubai, and then going down to a specific example when we put all the principles of the quality management into action. And because of its move to, towards uh, a more of a business excellence approach in terms of the standard, then I think worldwide more organisations now understand what business excellence is and uh, can hopefully uh, improve uh, their competitiveness. We need to seek perfection. So the measure of success ultimately is going to be or a measure of quality or a measure of what I call per perfection. Um, it might be an elusive concept, but we need to have it in mind. We need to have stretch goals towards perfection. We need to have our distinctiveness, our distinction. That is the true differentiating factor between excellence and average. And the distinctiveness really is the mark of excellence. And the mark of excellence is about having quality as the penultimate measure. What I want to do today is really uh, do a global perspective of, um, you know, what does quality mean, basically? Because at the heart of excellence is really having the uh, sense of uh, uh, quality um, and um, that commitment to the customer, um, that drive for innovation, um, and that discipline of continuous improvement. I mean, that is not going to fade away. And it will be interesting for you, as I will show you, um, what happened 50 odd years ago, uh, particularly what happened in Japan. And I have got some video clips which might be of interest. Do you like video clips? Are they boring? Okay, so I'll show you some more. If you don't like them, I don't have to show them. So. Okay, um, so let me just explore with you where we were 50 odd years ago. Where did we move to um, in the 70s, 80s? What became really exciting in the 1990s? And what are the challenges for the 21st century? So that will be really the journey of this presentation tonight. And I will assist myself with, um, you know, examples, with video clips, uh, so that it's, it's, not, it's not heavy on you. Um, and I hope at the end of it, we really uh, will understand um, the global perspective, basically the global common uh, elusive dream that every nation has and every organization has to compete at the highest level. But, I mean, maybe to kick off, uh, I'll just uh, use a couple of quotes. And incidentally, the, 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 some of the slides you don't have because I don't think you need them, um, you know, and um, 
um, if there is anything that is really of interest to you that you really want, uh, my colleagues here, Neelam and Jackie, you can just whisper in their ear and I'm sure that they will oblige. Um, and I try to make it compact. But I'm going to use more slides than what you have. That's really the message. Okay, let's look at the past in order to visualize whether things uh, as we face today are more intense, more complicated, faster, whatever it is. Peter Drecker, who passed away uh, recently at the age of 95, said, we believe that, um, you know, in the economic history, um, uh, particularly uh, the way the speed of doing things now is faster than ever before. Uh, and he was talking about the information revolution particularly. But in his own words, he said, the industrial revolution moved at least as fast in the same time span and had probably an equal impact, if not a greater one. Um, and if you look at the great revolutions, the industrial revolution, the um, automation revolution, uh, the mechanization of industry, and then um, particularly, I'm going to refer to this in a bit, the back end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s, when we start to talk about lean manufacturing and lean concepts, to me, that was radical change. That really took the world of business by surprise. And I've got a case study to show you with IBM. So let us not fool ourselves by saying that we live in an era where you know, things are happening faster than ever before, because that is not probably entirely true. I think it is true, however, that nowadays uh, we are appreciating what I call the soft things. Um, and this is a very nice quote from Lao Tzu, um, you know, 5000 BC basically, uh, who said that the softest things in the world overcome the hardest thing in the world. And I think we're talking about people here. You know, knowledge-based economy, intellectual capital, uh, that's really the asset. So the power is the power of the minds, and the battle really is the battle of ideas, and that's how we're going to move forward. And talking about power and empowerment, Stephen Covey has said, an empowered organization is one which engages its individuals who have the knowledge, the skill, the passion, the desire, and the opportunity to succeed as individuals, not necessarily as employees. And that's really uh, the synergy that we can create within an organization, the momentum that we can create. And you know what? When people talk about e-government and e-commerce, that is really handing the reins uh, to employees. Because in traditional setups, the way we do transactions, the way we make decisions, is uh, through a referral process, bottom up. You know, so the employee passes to the supervisor, the supervisor approves and passes to the head of the department, and so on and so on. So we play the safety game. And by the time we interface with the external world, we know we are pretty safe. But with the e-business, it's all real time. It's all happening behind the scene. It's all driven by information and empowerment. You think about it. It's a, a fraction of a second. You know, you receive a reply. You receive an acknowledgement. Your transaction goes through. Your choice is approved. The alternative is given to you. We live in, in an era where we really liberated the minds and really engaged people. And I think that this is why the battle of uh, the 21st century is really going to be the battle of the, the minds and the battle of ideas. But talking about battles, let's go back um, to the, uh, the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it was the battle for waste elimination. That's where quality started. Um, it started uh, particularly in the wake of the uh, depression the economic depression in the States in, in the early 30s um, um, and with the creation, if you like, of uh, uh, this fantastic innovation called the, um, the, uh, the control chart or the Shewitt uh, chart, um, which is really to look at um, uh, variation within processes to combat waste, to eliminate scrap, to minimize basically variability. That was an, an innovation which has saved industry. Um, and obviously, um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell into, uh, if you like, the technical side of the kind of variation that exists, common and special causes. But at the end of the day, this was a breakthrough that was meant to help managers or senior executives make the right decisions about products and services 
and uh, supporting, um, uh, if you like, uh, uh, managers. So the control chart gave the birth to the Plan Do Check Act, which is the Shewitt cycle, which later on was changed to the Deming cycle. It was trying to get the mindset not just to be limited to sorting out the good from the bad, you know, because the inspection lines, the production lines was, if it is not um, to the right quality, put it on this heap on the side and only allow the good things to, to go to the customer. And nobody worried about that heap growing high, higher and higher or costing more and more because at the end of the day, as long as we have enough quantity or as long as we can produce fast enough to satisfy the deadlines, the delivery dates that we commit to the customer, then we're doing okay. And when you are in an era where the demand uh, is high than the supply, then there is nothing to worry about because you don't have to go out and beg for business. And that's exactly the, that era, basically. So the control chart was not meant to reinforce that mindset. It was very much to say, let's not just detect, let's not just have an inspection, ingrained, if you like, inspection mentality. Let's try to prevent by doing plan to check do root cause analysis, identify what causes these problems, eliminate them once and for all. However, um, as time uh, uh, has progressed, uh, senior managers, uh, and in the eyes of this great uh, man, uh, Dr. Edward Deming, um, who became very frustrated until he died, uh, senior managers did not really find statistics very appealing. They didn't want to waste their time understanding variability. And here's his famous quote. He said, we have learned to live in a world of mistakes and defective products as if there was a necessity for life. And he said, it is time to adopt a new philosophy in America. Famously, obviously, in 1980, uh, he was interviewed by CBS. And uh, I think he, he was quoted as saying, if, you, if Japan can, why can't we? Um, and that was the wake-up call that America has received. This other man, um, Dr. Joseph Duran, um, at the same time um, developed, if you like, another perspective. He said statistics are very important, but we really need to understand how to control company-wide this concept called quality. But we, we need to learn how to manage and maintain the gains. So he famously uh, developed the Duran trilogy by saying that uh, first of all, we need to plan where we are, where we want to go, and then we need to do the Kaizen, the Plan, Do, Check, Act. We need to improve quality and then maintain it at the new level. And then we need basically to look at breakthrough projects, uh, real innovations, and all the way uh, holding the gains and maintaining, uh, if you like, standards of performance that really have appealed to the customer. And Duran was more effective with his message to top managers. He had more appeal because he spoke their language and he understood really, uh, uh, you know, what uh, perspectives he could bring in. Um, he has been referred to as the father of quality. Um, he's still alive. He's 102 this year. Um, but he's recognized uh, for his emphasis on people rather than his emphasis on statistics. Um, and as I said, it's the total perspective of quality that he's contributed to. Um, I think uh, the, the fact that he recognized that you cannot really create breakthrough with quality management unless you have leadership involved um, has uh, really facilitated the growth and uh, development of quality in various parts of the world. Um, these two giants, obviously, I am singling them out tonight because of their unique contributions. They have both helped transform Japan, as you will see shortly. Um, their philosophies are not contradictory. Um, I mean, they are very much complementary. Uh, Deming wanted really this um, uh, variation, the study of variation as a philosophy. Uh, you know, he later on called it profound knowledge. It's the knowledge of work as a system. is understanding what uh, hampers work as a system and using the psychology of work to motivate people basically to combat waste and really optimize work and creating perfection using statistical analysis and statistical techniques. But that was 
really saying to the, the top managers, you need to be perfect. You need to abandon what you have and embrace a new philosophy. And that's why he found it a little bit difficult to sell to top management. Giran, on the other hand, with his incremental approach, project by project, had more appeal because he reinforces the visions that managers pursue. But he invites them, basically, to integrate things, to look at people um, uh, in relation to systems, in relation to technology. And, uh, and he has produced a lot of uh, how to do things, tools and techniques uh, that, that have helped um, uh, top managers. So I'm going to show you um, uh, uh, another clip, uh, if you don't mind. And it tells you about these two giants, first of all, and uh, what happened uh, in Japan. Um, that was the first miracle, if you like, of quality. If you get gains in productivity only because people work smarter, not harder, that is total profit. And it multiplies several times. Dr. Dimming, who is now 79, and his wife have lived for some years in this house in Washington. His office is in the basement, and Mrs. Deming is one of his assistants. He works constantly and has absolute faith that his system of statistical analysis helps industry. He was equally certain of it when he went to Japan to teach it there. I think uh, that I, I was the only man in 1950 that believed that the Japanese could invade the markets of the world and would within four years. If the Japanese were impressed with Deming and his system of quality production through statistical analysis, and they were, they were no more impressed with Deming than he was with them. What I saw was a magnificent workforce, unsurpassed management, and the best statistical ability in the world. It seemed to me that those three forces could be put together, and I put them together so that Japanese quality instead of being shoddy, became known within a few years. In less than four years, manufacturers were all over the world were screaming for protection. Nobody comes out of the school of business that knows what management is or what his deficiencies are. No one coming out of a school of business that ever heard of the answers that I'm giving to your questions or probably even thought of the questions. Sounds a little harsh, Doctor. Yes, I am harsh. I should know what I'm talking about. Is there an attitudinal difference between the United States and Japan? They are using statistical methods. They have not only learned them, they have absorbed them. Our Japanese absorb other good things of cultures. They are uh, giving back to the world the uh, products of statistical control of quality in a form that the world never saw before. Would the same methods work in the United States? Could we do the same thing? Well, of course we could. Then Everybody why? knows that we can do it. We why no, don't we? No determination to do it. We have no idea what, um, what the right thing to do. We have no goal. There is clearly something in his heart that's propelling him. His pocketbook's not what's propelling him. His heart is propelling him. I've got to repay a debt. And not just to, uh, to America, where, of course, there's a big debt there, but also to society generally. I'm a member of the human race. And the human race is, uh, needs a lot of improvement. And I'd like to help.
1987, Emperor Hirohito conferred on Dr. J.M. Juran the highest award that can be given to a non-Japanese, the Order of the Sacred Treasure. In recognition of Juran's contribution to the Japanese miracle. It was a miracle of post-war industrial rebirth, economic recovery, and eventual domination of many industries in the United States and around the world. How did the Japanese achieve their miracle? Quality. Quality rescued the nation from ruin and from a reputation as the world's manufacturer of junk. The irony was that Japan learned the lessons of quality from American business consultants, notably W. Edwards Deming and Joseph Duran. The whole direction of the country was suddenly smashed up. Complete discontinuity. Trying to achieve uh, their place in the sun by military means, and now that was gone, they had to turn around and do it by trade if they were going to do it. It is almost impossible to realize how fragile that society was, how close to the abyss of social disintegration it was. The old leadership was totally discredited, not just purged. The new people had, all they knew was that the things they had grown up in no longer worked. その Japan looked for help to the leading industrial nation on Earth. Dr. Deming, the first American quality consultant to arrive in Japan, preached statistical quality control, a method used by engineers and technicians to determine whether or not a product has been manufactured to the intended specifications. Juran, by contrast, taught Japanese companies that statistical methods were not enough. Senior management must take personal responsibility for making quality happen. And ultimately, everyone in the organization, Juran argued, must become involved in making many, many improvements year after year. During his many visits to Japan during the 1950s and 60s, Juran found himself lecturing to the top executives of the leading Japanese corporations. お話は彼らが経営者が管理者が品質管理のためにドクタージュランはま日本のマネジメントの人たちに対するま品質に対する意識ま改善に対するこうあの even the Japanese mindset was, uh, was really down. And to seek help from two Americans, bear in mind the role of America in destroying the infrastructure in Japan, and in a humble way basically to accept that, the learning from these two giants and to rebuild the economy 
and, and then go on to dominate the world for over 50 years, uh, that's something special. I don't think we can really brush aside this uh, great experience as we embark on the 21st century. So I think that would be a key reference for yet generations to come. Then quality was embraced by the West um, in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, particularly in the United States. Uh, Europe copied what was going on in the States. And then I called it the, the second phase, basically was the battle for quality management. I think at that stage, it was not really to say, can we improve products, can we improve uh, services? The chief executive officers in the West were shrewder. They were saying, is this going to have an impact on bottom line? Is this going to be really sold to our shareholders? Will it help, if you like, the return uh, on investment? And will the financial city, um, uh, you know, basically um, accept that, you know, it's worth our while investing in, in something which is long-term driven. And those arguments went on for a large number of years. I mean, I, uh, we were very privileged. Uh, we, I mean, talking about the European Centre of TQM, we did the first study in Europe trying to prove that there is a link between uh, em the embracing quality management and uh, financial results. Although we looked at 29 organisations throughout Europe, and we looked at their data for five years and then another five years, uh, the, the results were very encouraging. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we even uh, had a f featured in the Financial Times, at the, you know, at the time and so on and so forth. So that really was an important era to embrace quality, not just as an operational tool for optimization uh, and improving uh, services uh, and so on, but to link it to business survival, to link it to really the performance of the businesses. And um, our study, we called it the Bradford study, was one of several. Uh, I'm not going to say much about the, the, the Singhal and the Hendricks study because Professor Singhal, as you see from your program, will be next week's speaker. We're flying him from Georgia Tech, from the States, to come all the way here and tell you about this mega big um, research that they've done there. And it's worth um, uh, waiting for that. But uh, I will talk about it in passing. Uh, the first study was the Japanese Union of Scientists and Engineers, which was done in the early 80s, because Japan did not need to prove that quality works. They embraced it because they believe in quality. Their economy was in tatters. Uh, they were the laughing stock of the world. You know, a product made in Japan was really the joke uh, at the time. Um, you know, and, um, and they needed something which brings back discipline. They needed something really to convince the skeptics and Juicy did this study by looking at 26 winners of the most prestigious award in Japan, the Deming Prize, and they looked at their performance over 20 years. The conclusion was very simple. Those 26 companies are still in business. They, their performance increases um, uh, every year. They outsmart their key competitors by a factor of 1%, 12% in sales uh, revenues. And nobody heard of this study. They just did it, you know, as, as something to do. Um, so th uh, that was the first one. The Bradford study I've uh, talked about. The Americans created a fictitious thing called, the, um, I mean, the NIST uh, study, the National Institute for Standards and Technology. It was a hypothetical study. They said, suppose uh, you invest $1,000 in a company that has won the American Quality Award, the, Deming, uh, the uh, Malcolm Baldrige Award. What would your returns look like? Okay, so if, I if you invested in Motorola, Motorola won the Baldrige Award in 1988, what would your returns look like? And every year they compiled data on the winners of the Baldrige Award, i.e. the companies that have embraced quality fully. And you will see that the data looks really uh, fantastic. Um, so the Bradford study, uh, concluded that those 29 companies that have embraced quality, uh, they had higher sales turnover per employee than their key competitors, higher productivity levels. I mean, look at the percentages. 81% out of this sample confirmed, uh, uh, if you like, uh, that statistic. 
they pay people better salaries. Obviously, there's a factor there that needs to be bear in mind. Higher profit and higher uh, net asset stoma. In all, we had eight um, performance indicators that we looked at. This is just a snapshot. This is the NIST study. This is really looking at it from a 10-year perspective. This list here compares the growth of the average companies, the S&P 500 list, compared to the winners of the Baldrige Award for that 10-year duration period. I would like to draw your attention to the right-hand side, the percentage change. You can see that um, there is a factor of uh, 4 to 1, at least. The Baldrige winners uh, outsmart the average performers in the S&P list by a factor of 4 to 1. 800% growth over 10 years as opposed to 221 uh, percentage growth uh, for the, the average. Uh, the bottom one is not of interest to us. That's really um, the holding companies. How well have they done as well? And bear in mind that the bottom one is, uh, will not really give us the correlation with quality management because it could be uh, because of this uh, you know, subsidy transfer from one subsidiary to another. It could be investment in technology, it could be whatever. <coughs> but the, to the top statistics are the correct ones because those are the subsidiaries or the divisions that have won the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award. So th those statistics are, if you like, uh, um, more accurate. This continues, by the way. The Baldrige continues. Um, I mean, the NIST continues to publish the statistics. Um, you, if you want to have a look, uh, www.nist.org, and you can see the latest. What does the Baldrige list look like as 2004, 2005, and so on and so forth. So I think what I'm trying to say is this is the Singhal and uh, Hendricks study they looked at a much, much larger sample, 600 companies, and also they had a control group, i.e. those organizations that uh, are not supposed to have embraced quality principles. And they also, they looked at it for uh, what they call the pre-winning uh, the pre Baldrige uh, uh, period and then the post-winning. And they looked at, if you like, the exponential growth in terms of uh, performance as a result of embracing quality principles. I'm not going to go uh, into the detail of that. You will hear it next week um, sufficiently to say that even uh, SMEs, small to medium-sized enterprise, they do well with quality. So quality does not really need uh, capital investment. It doesn't need high resources uh, to be uh, embraced. Uh, quality is a very simple concept. It is about engaging people. And it's about using very simple tools for improvement. And in fact, in their study, the SMEs did even better than the large corporations. Uh, you can see the conclusion at the bottom. Lower capital intensive firms achieved significantly better than higher capital intensive ones. And of course, it's about efficiency as well, isn't it? So uh, that is the, uh, uh, if you like, the period of the 80s and the 90s. Um, it was a tough period, believe me. I remember the days when I used to go and try to convince uh, uh, you know, board members in various organizations about the merits of quality, and they used to give me a hard time. Uh, we didn't have enough evidence. If you also remember, um, quality was um, introduced by practitioners. It was not the uh, academic community who pioneered. We were more or less working from behind, you know, trying to understand what has gone on in industry that has really created this miracle? And try to document it, try to create case studies, try to do research retrospectively. The Bradford study was looking at uh, uh, retrospective data, historical data. You, you know, it was not predictive. We, we, we didn't have the means to say, you do this and you do that and you emphasize on that and the results will look after themselves. No way we could do that. It was a tough time, but I think gradually, um, you know, we could see that, for example, organizations have become more daring uh, in terms of their corporate reporting, for example. In 1993, we did a benchmarking study to look at the commitment to quality from the point of view of communicating to the shareholders in the financial cities. 
we benchmark the top 100 FTSE uh, companies uh, using eight parameters and we compared them to a random list and the language was very dry, very boring. It was all financial, you know. They wouldn't utter the word empowerment. They wouldn't utter the word system. The word quality does not exist. And that was a disappointing uh, finding from our point of view because the top 100 companies were re very much at the same level as the random sample. You know, you pick a company report now and it's a different proposition altogether. The language is softer. They're proud of their visions. The long-term perspective is clearly illustrated. You know, the transparency about performance is there. The emphasis on non-financial performance indicators is there. So we have moved on. The battle of total quality management has been won. You know, so much so that uh, in the public domain, you know, we have got case studies, we've got various, uh, uh, if you like, examples. We have mechanisms for effecting it. We have tools and techniques that we can use. It has been so pervasive. Even the public sector has been re-engineered completely transformed. You know, the notion of customer now is not alien to the benefits agencies. In fact, the benefits agencies in this country, um, you know, went on to win the British Quality Award. The inland revenue, the tax man, most of us don't like the tax man, you know, have gone on to win the British Quality Award and to be close second for the European Quality Award. That's not because they just put a little bit of veneer and changed the wording and they got away with it. That's because there has been a radical transformation in organizational thinking. So I think that's, if you like, an era which we can celebrate. But as we move forward now towards the 21st century, the question is, is it the end of quality? The cynics will say, yes, it's superseded. The language is dead. You know, we don't talk about products anymore. And I think the optimists will say, hang on a minute. Maybe total quality management, with our understanding of where it has come from, via Japan, via Deming, via Duran, the emphasis on the product and the surface, maybe that's really now diminished. But having said that, to say we can abandon it is really severing, if you like, the umbilical cord and, and killing uh, the future of organizations. So I think it's probably fair and more accurate to say that as we move towards the 21st century, quality becomes a license to practice. If you have it, you more or less can um, enter the arena and you, you can survive. If you don't have it, you don't stand a chance because the customers now are more real than ever before. But before we really move to the 21st century, there was another era uh, which really brought more challenges optimization of products and services, improving quality, delivery and service and so on and so forth. But there was an era of speed, wasn't there? The word speed and agility. I call it the battle for lean, lean production, whether it's in the service or uh, uh, if you like uh, manufacturing. This chart is just to uh, recap what I've been saying. Um, uh, basically, you know, and we can go as far as um, 1850 when, you know, that was really the start of the uh, Industrial Revolution um, and uh, where we moved from, uh, if you like, the artisan, uh, uh, craftsman um, uh, kind of mentality towards using factories and using work which is better organized. Um, then we had some scientific concepts um, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, Frederick Taylor, uh, and others, you know, time and motion studies um, um, and, um, you know, uh, Alton uh, uh, Feo and, you know, and others. So we had really uh, a wonderful, uh, if you like, uh, uh, radical departure, uh, you know, from relying on, if you like, dexterity. And then, of course, in the 30s, as I was saying, control charts, statistical uh, techniques, uh, defined quality in more tangible terms. Um, and then 1950s, Henry Ford introduced uh, mass production. And then Japan introduced 
the concept of lean. These two gentlemen, uh, Shigo Shingo and Ono, uh, have invented the Toyota production system, just-in-time Kanban, stockless production, how you deal with suppliers, and defined the work system in a radical way. Um, and um, I think lean manufacturing was a big wake-up call for the West. And that book, The Man That Changed, the, the, the Machine That Changed the World, um, uh, you know, was uh, really documenting the Toyota production system and what was going on at the time. So a lot of mileage was achieved, uh, if you like, in that sense. I was going to uh, show you another video clip, but um, I don't know whether I can do it, Glenn. I will try. In September 1992, we announced the PS Value Point system, and with it, a dramatic change of strategy for the rapidly developing IBM PC company. The price was competitive, the product flexible, and the choice for the customer virtually unlimited. In parallel, we introduced a new, fast response, customer order and distribution process, a vital factor for success in the dynamic PC marketplace, allowing IBM to deliver the selected value point system to our customer's address anywhere in Europe within five days of confirmation of their order. for you is probably the 6381 series of the SI value points. Delivery of a complete personal computer system within five days of confirmation of an order to a customer anywhere in Europe is good and it's what IBM's customers want. IBM has always been at the leading edge of computer technology but recognized the need to have a customer order and delivery process of the same high quality as its product range. Prior to PS Value Point, once a customer had chosen the system they required, the selling agent would contact their local IBM order desk to inquire about product availability. Speed of response relied on the availability of the various links in the chain, mainly at the end of a phone. Even if the computer and all the required peripherals were available, okay. it could take days to gather them together at one transit point. This protracted response cycle sometimes meant that IBM sales personnel were not able to give a committed delivery date. Some customers would accept this out of loyalty to IBM and because the IBM product was the one they wanted. Others sought an alternative supplier who could deliver immediately or at least give a committed delivery date. The satisfaction of a customer order was a cumbersome, complex process involving dealers, manufacturing, distribution and individual country shipping agents. The complete process could take up to three weeks. Hello? Oh, I'm sorry, there's one item I haven't got in stock. It's estimated that less than two-thirds of IBM's customers were prepared to accept this situation. The loss of business was unacceptable. Today, rapid response is the answer. It enables IBM to respond instantly to changing market trends. The result? More sales, more profit, and more satisfied customers. That's your order confirmed. Your new system unit will be delivered within five days. Already in many countries, and ultimately everywhere, IBM dealers can electronically send an order inquiry to their country order desk. Online, it's checked against a continually updated central inventory of parts in Greenock. If the various components are in the warehouse, the order is confirmed immediately, again by electronic mail. If a part is not immediately available, a date is provided indicating when it will be. With the order confirmed, an online instruction is issued to the Greenock warehouse. The required information is also transmitted to the assembly and transit facilities where a hard copy is printed. The process of configuring an order then starts. First, the installation of the customer's selected hard disk and expanded memory requirements. Computerized quality control checks ensure each task is completed in line with the customer's order before the next task begins. Software is loaded through a sophisticated local area network 
using advanced IBM 9595 personal systems. The assembly area is designed to be flexible and can change product lines within minutes. When a large number of orders is received, extra people can be called in to cope with the increased demand. The keyboard, any peripherals which have been ordered, and any appropriate documentation in one of 21 available languages are grouped together on a ready trolley. When the software is loaded, the system and selected peripherals are carefully boxed, once again under computerized quality control. After sealing and labeling, the box is loaded onto the customer's pallet, where it's joined by the specified monitor. The pallets are taken to the transit area, ready to be loaded onto the lorry bound for the country of destination. Twenty-four hours after receipt of the order, the lorry sets off, and within the next four days, our customer will receive her PS Value Point system. That's our promise. Rapid response is good for IBM. It's good for IBM's dealers. But above all, it's good for IBM's customers. Okay, so those of you who have been impressed, uh, I'm, just, I'm sorry to say that was 1994. So we have moved on since. I mean, you could see from the, the PCs and uh, the screens that that was all technology. But nonetheless, I think we cannot really let this era go unnoticed. Uh, lean... Uh, the concept of lean was real. Uh, it has demonstrated that we can combat waste in a different fashion by uh, integrating, if you like, harmonizing parts and families of parts for products and services. It's also about the flexibility of the work layout. You know, we can produce small scale and large scale. We can add capacity, we can subscribe without really incurring, if you like, the high costs. Uh, of, of, of production, of manufacturing, whatever. But more importantly, we can engage more with the customer and we can give better commitments to the customer. So it, it was a quality language, it was a quality practice uh, that was using a different uh, language uh, because uh, the Toyota production system was born in manufacturing and therefore the language was more heavily engineering rather than customer oriented. Nonetheless, <coughs> I think it's something to note. Then we moved into what I call the battle for excellence. Uh, the growth of, um, uh, if you like, the concept of excellence and the assessment of excellence in organizations. And each nation basically uh, copied what went on in Japan. Remember what I said about Japan, they had the Deming Price, which is a model for auditing and assessing organizational drive towards excellence. The Americans created the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award in 1987. Uh, Europe followed immediately after that and created the European uh, Quality Award, uh, which later on became the, the excellence model. Uh, I will show you the proliferation of um, models of excellence around the world. Almost every country around the world has got, if you like, a means by which they can audit and assess and evaluate excellence. Now, that has been very significant. If you tell me from a research or an academic viewpoint whether this is, um, if you like, something that I will rank very highly, and I would say probably this revolution uh, has, uh, is higher than what went on in the 50s, uh, without any exaggeration. Um, I mean, the, the uptake of the principles of excellence was just, you know, surprising, to say the least, um, because of the genesis of the concept, but also the simplicity of absorbing the concept and the lack of uh, expertise uh, required and the lack of resource uh, demands on introducing those concepts. Um, you know, um, I mean, even the University of Bradford uh, is using the principles of excellence and has been assessing itself against uh, world-class standards from that point of view. So uh, that was a good revolution. Uh, fundamentally, what are these principles of excellence telling us? What are we trying to... Uh, evaluate. At the simplest level, we are saying that excellence has to be driven. And what does that mean? It means that we have to have a process called leadership and constancy of purpose. You know, 
we need to really define the parameters for uh, driving that excellence. We need to really have uh, some underlying principles, some guiding principles and some values that will tell us that we are here to stay, we are here basically uh, to serve. And then you have, uh, uh, if you like, the other pillars of excellence. Um, I mean, they're not in a particular order, but organizations have to create a culture which propels itself forward, uh, continuous improvement, continuous learning, uh, the drive for innovation. Um, there has to be a lot of emphasis on people, people development and involvement, and particularly um, in the 21st century. There has to be emphasis on process management and the management by facts. That's the rigid, hard bit, if you like. But, you know, ev everybody can be a good driver. But uh, if you are driving in a, in, a, in, a, in a highway system which is well-defined, where the roads are nicely labeled, nicely laid out, then the performance is going to be an optimum level. But if you take a Ferrari and take it to a field, you know, an agricultural field, you know, there is no way you're going to be able to drive it to an optimum level. So process management creates that discipline, creates the consistency which is required uh, for performance. Customer focus, obviously, um, excellence is synonymous with the customer. So we need to create a mindset that really constantly looks at the customer. And I'm not just saying, uh, do you measure customer satisfaction, guys, you know? Or do you gather information on complaints and you try to deal with them? That's boring. That's a very, very basic elementary stuff. But the mindset is uh, the skills and the competencies of people who serve the customer, how you define the voice of the customer at the strategic level, and how you define these uh, highway systems that I'm talking about, which links you directly, gets you to look all the time at the customer. And how do you put systems that will not inhibit your drive towards excellence and your drive towards satisfying the customer, but will enable you to get there quickly, efficiently, effectively, reliably, and so on and so forth. So lots of conditions are behind those little words, so, you know, such as customer focus. Results orientation is also about a mindset. It's really saying, what do you, not what you produce at the, at the end in a lagging fashion, but how do you manage results? How do you affect the optimum uh, perspectives of your organization? You know, have you got balanced perspective? Do you look at financial and non-financial data? You know, when you measure, do you do something about it with immediate effect? Do you integrate the data and the outcomes from your performance with strategy at the top to realign, to revisit your KPIs, you know, to put new targets and so on? The level of sophistication does not come in one year or two years. You know, you have to grow with it and you have to really build if there are competencies, uh, discipline, and mindset behaviors. Partnership is going to be big, isn't it? I mean, it has been big in the 20th century. It's going to be even bigger in the 21st century. Leveraging is essential for large and small organizations. Integrating your suppliers and your partners, building strategic alliances with them, sharing information, protocols for knowledge transfer, and so on and so forth. And, of course, the last one that is there is uh, public responsibility social responsibility, corporate social responsibility, being a good corporate citizen. You know, this is not just about the environment um, and it's not just about safety. It's about taking the brand um, of the organization within the community. It's being an exemplar in terms of your employment practices, in terms of your um, approach to green issues and recycling and, uh, and environmental issues. It's also to do with... Uh, influencing, if you like, uh, safety um, uh, aspects, welfare of employees, and also it's the services that you render to local communities and uh, communities in the wider perspective. Big, big thing. Although in these excellence models, uh, this particular slice of the pie is only given something like 6% in terms of weighting, but nonetheless, survey after survey indicates that particularly with the young people, 19 to 25 year olds, uh, they purchase and their loyalty is very much based on how they perceive, um, you know, these, uh, uh, these brands, uh, how they perceive them in terms of their commitment to environmental issues and social issues. And I think it's going to grow uh, even more significantly. So I think rather than give you lots of statistics and bore you to death about the growth of excellence around the world, 
Um, I'm going to just uh, keep quiet and flick through, and you're going to see loads of pictures about awards, right, all over the world. And uh, you, uh, hopefully, um, you will not be dazzled, but you might be. These are real awards from real countries in different parts of the world. That's not the total. These are just some of the awards that exist in different countries. Okay. So, the battle of excellence is here, is taking place. You go to a place like Nepal. Has anybody, does anybody know that Nepal exists as a country? It's part of India, but, you know, it's there, isn't it? Nepal has got the National Quality Award. Countries, poor countries like Bangladesh, Gabon. You know where Gabon is? In Africa? Tiny country. It's got a National Quality Award. You know, there's countries who aspire to become excellent. We cannot deny them that legitimate right, you know? Every country, every nation wants to uh, survive, wants to prosper, wants to dominate, and wants to have its own identity. Uh, this is the hope that quality gives to uh, nations. In parallel to excellence, we entered, if you like, an era of knowledge-based competitiveness. And again, rather than bombard you with lots of theory about that, I just will use probably a couple of slides just to show you the transition uh, from what I call uh, the P economy or product-based economy to K economy or knowledge economy. This transformation has existed. Those of you in this room who basically are cynical and saying, no, I don't believe that this knowledge stuff will ever take off and, and will change anything, I'm sorry to say it's already happened. You're too late with your statement. You know, we have to learn how to handle the complexity that a knowledge-based work organization gives us and the knowledge-based competitiveness demands on us uh, to adjust with. If you w look at basically a traditional value chain or extended supply chain. This one is really a retailing example. Uh, you know, you could really relate it to a healthcare situation um, or a government service provision uh, setup or an oil and gas uh, setup, whatever it is. Essentially, you've got three components in supply chain or value chain. You've got what I call the upstream or creative side of any business, any organization. You've got the midstream, the belly, which is the productive uh, side. And then you've got the downstream, which is the delivery side, which interfaces with the customer, with the consumer. So you could be a B2B, you know, basically you business to business kind of um, uh, setup, or you could have an extended chain, so B2B to C. You deal directly with consumers and paying customers. So all of this is real. Now, this is traditional. It is telling you that all of it is touch and feel, okay? We conceive a product, in this particular case, um, the, the company is Arla Foods, Arla in Leeds, dairy uh, products, milk and cheeses and what have you. Um, how do you develop the brand? How do you acquire, uh, basically, um, uh, ingredients from your suppliers to help you produce? Um, and then how do you um, uh, basically stock up, uh, create an inventory, and then how do you distribute from a B2B perspective to uh, major retailers like Asda and uh, Sainsbury's and what have you, and how in turn do they sell to us as the shoppers? But how do you create customer relationship management with category management with the uh, retailers, but also with the loyalty with the brand i.e. the consumers. So that's a traditional supply chain, extended supply chain, i.e. value chain. Now, to bear in mind, in the 20th century, the touch was real. We touched the product. We designed prototypes. You know, we, we pilot, we produce, we taste. Uh, we meet the customer face to face. We create focus groups. This is how business was done. The assertion I'm making in a knowledge-based context is that gradually we are shifting 
if you like, the emphasis from a real value chain to a virtual value chain, where we distance uh, people from each other and the touch uh, perspective becomes less and less. So the manual means are, are, are you know, becoming less and less. Factories now are not really important. So you know, in, a, in, a, in a 21st century value chain, you don't have to have factories. Somebody else can do the production for you. Just outsource it. Dell computers, when they came onto the scene, they said, we don't need intermediaries. We will go straight to the customer. But also they said, we don't need to be silly to invest in factories. You know, we will just work with suppliers. All what we need to own is the customer interface, the network. That's all what we need to do. And of course, they've been successful. So the second assertion in a knowledge-based economy is that we don't need to really render value through capital investment. We don't have, because it doesn't really give you a core competitive advantage when you think about it. I mean, if you take oil, the oil companies, I don't know whether you noticed this trend, because I've done a lot of work in the oil and petrochemical industry. In the old days, they used to say upstream. The, the more upstream they are, the more profitable they are, because that's where the money is. Drilling, producing oil, and then distributing it is somebody else's business. You know? But we, you know, we get the big well, you know, and we produce, and then we all that. Now, you know, 50 years on, whatever it is, the oil companies are reclaiming the petrol station, the retailing sites, because they have realized they're far, far, far too distant from the consumer, from the customer. And what will happen when the oil runs out? You know, they're dead. They don't have a future. So the, the emphasis has been shifted, if you like. So that is the second assertion. The third assertion is that the value added through skills and competencies is still going to remain significant. In other words, we will still need uh, specialist skills and specialist competencies, but also we need this cross-disciplinarity. <coughs> it's really vital that we create the cross-disciplinarity because if you are operating as an e-business uh, on an e-commerce basis, you're going to need people who know what they're doing, first of all, but in the event where they need to consult with a colleague, they have to know who has got the piece of knowledge, who can help out, and then while the customer is online waiting, you see, so real-time responsiveness is also the other challenge. But the fourth one, which is the biggest assertion I'm making tonight, is that virtuality is reality. In other words, we have really made the customer and the consumer move from a passive situation where they are receiving something into a customer who is pulling because they are sitting on the other side from the outside and they can enter the factory, they can enter the shop floor, they can enter the supermarket and they can place their order. We don't have you know, to push something out to them. Just think about it please because you, know, you can check yourself in now in a hotel I travel a lot, and I mean, if you land somewhere like Dubai, for example, they have a very sophisticated uh, e-government services. You can have your passport stamped without having it stamped, so to speak. You know, it's all done uh, through e, uh, on an e-basis. You can pay your fines, police fines, or what have you, from a virtual basis. You can set up a business by filling the forms online, and you get a real-time receipt. You know, it's all amazing. So those of you who are skeptical tonight, please understand that this is already happening. We cannot deny it. What does it mean? What am I trying to say? Is that we can look back and say, Dr. Deming, please help. Come and tell us about variation. Or Dr. Giran, come and tell us how we can use your triology methodology to cope with this. And they may not be able to help us. We have to... Uh, help ourselves so as we move uh, in this direction I think it's because we have moved the agenda for quality we have moved it to something that we call the battle of customer centricity and what does that mean it really means that we moved away gradually uh, from a push mentality into a pull mentality this is a chart it's a little bit old because uh, 
you know, the, uh, the, the trend stops at 1999. But if you look at the different shades of blue, it is telling us the proportion, basically, that we started, first of all, to uh, uh, mass produce and mass push. So the dealer supplies everybody else. And um, we started also to work, place an order via the dealer. So if it's not there, the dealer will get an order. So, but we cannot really get close to the original manufacturer. Or if we're lucky, we might have a distribution center uh, in Bradford or in Leeds near where we live for convenience sake. <coughs> but built to order in 1992 was really a small proportion as you can see. Just in the space of seven or eight years, the buying from the de de uh, dealer has shrunk significantly. The buying through the dealer has shrunk significantly. The interface directly with rep centers representing the original manufacturer have increased significantly. And the response of manufacturers by building to order has increased significantly. And you have seen the case study of IBM, the rapid response. You know, you come to a, a center, you say, this is what I would like to buy. Can you do it for me? And a consultant or somebody who's got the expertise, they can tell you whether they can do something that you want and they can pledge a delivery date for you. And that was a big wow factor at the time. But the trend did not stop there. The trend continued beyond that, where we said to the customer, you don't even need to bother coming to a center and, and sit next to a person who will tell you. You can do it from the comfort of your home. You, know? you can click and enter and choose the colors. I mean, for example, ICI, you know, the way they sell you paint nowadays, you know, they get you to mix your own paint. You know, we've got different tastes. If you are decorating a new flat, you can enter the site and you can say, I want a shade of blue, but I want it to mix with yellow and I want to do this. When you are comfortable with the shade that you want, for me only, then you can place your order and the the chemists basically will go and they will produce the formulation that is for me only kind of perspective. So we put the reins in the hands of the customer. That's what customer centricity is about. That's what the customer PLC that we will talk about in a few minutes is about. So where are we now? If you remember the Shakespearean uh, question, to, to be or not to be, that's the question. Here the question is to E or not to E, okay? Um, in other words, should we go internet, yes or no, or should we go um, virtual, yes or no, um, start of customer PLC. But the question is, I think we must understand that E also stands for I. When we work on a virtual basis, the mindset has to say, I am talking to a person here, okay? I'm not operating a computer. You know, the wording, the message, the interface, the helpfulness, the empathy, you know, all those words that we teach in our marketing books, you know, are real. We're dealing with a customer. The person behind the scene should not just be selected on the basis that they can type 160 words per minute. You know, they should be selected because they have feelings for the customer. They can empathize. They can be helpful. They can be entrepreneurially driven. And then, of course, if they have the dexterity skills, so for the better. That's what we want. So to I and to E will always remain there. But I think we moved one notch further. We moved to something called emotionally as well. So, you know, uh, tickling the customer uh, and getting them to uh, be loyal uh, to your brand. So the new era uh, now is not just to seek customer satisfaction but is really to uh, create an emotional response from the customer by giving them a unique experience, an experience that will get them to commit through loyalty and uh, for the companies to create a competitive edge. And that will really differentiate between those um, who are world class and the rest of the pack. So the customer pulls, the customer PLC analogy is right, and the customer delight comes from 
an emotional response from the customer. Uh, here's a survey in 2002, which really was polling um, uh, senior executives. And the response from the, most of them, 85%, was the same. They are saying it's no longer sustainable nowadays to differentiate on what they call the physical aspects of customer experience. Price, quality, and delivery are the parameters which have helped us basically pioneer and dominate in the 20th century. And I have went through those battles, basically, and those milestones uh, to tell you uh, what they have done in terms of uh, transformations. The battle now is more about the subtle, intangible uh, impact we create on the customer. And the inventing language such as uh, customer experience management is, is important. What does that mean? It means that we look at the cumulative impact on how we interface with the customer, the various interactions, um, if you like, throughout the, 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 if you like, the various touch points of the, uh, the, the, the brand, throughout the life cycle of the business, of the transaction to that particular customer, and really looking at it more in terms of the beliefs, the feelings, and attitudes that we generate. Because in, 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 a, in the conventional sense, we can do that because we can see the customer all the time. And when we dip, we can recover the service. But doing it in a subtle uh, way, in a virtual environment, is a real challenge. But it is happening. You know, it, is, it, is, it is happening. There is more and more investment towards putting front, uh, if you like, front line support for the customers 24-7, um, uh, basically your own consultant, your own mentor. Um, you know, I mean, some of the uh, organizations have even created these virtual people. Hi, my name is Jackie, and I'm here to help you. You know, uh, ask me any questions. So there is a real person talking to you. Emirates Airlines, I think, if, if you want to visit their website, they have a virtual person who is there, and uh, she gives her name as well. She tells you she, she's the same person talking to everybody, but that's besides the point. But she's only talking to one person at a time because we all have different problems. So they're trying to create an emotional response by saying it's too abstract just doing it via emails, you know, and uh, if you like abstract messages. So they're bringing that into it. And I think we're going to see more and more emphasis on the emotional side of quality because there is more and more realization that uh, the customer buys into the brand and the customer PLC is really what is important. You know, shall I tell you something? The most loyal, and Neelam here, you can talk to her during the break by saying, we're going to really design sophisticated seats for our premium customers, you know, that can recline 90 degrees, 180 degrees, whatever. Uh, we will bring the best chefs uh, in the aircraft to prepare for you any meals that you want, any food that you want. We will let you put together your own entertainment package during the flight, wherever it is. And the only thing you want to do is sleep. That's a waste of money, isn't it? Just think about it. But emotionally, that person does not pay, does not mind paying 4,000 pounds or 5,000 pounds for a first class ticket because they, they buy something else. You know, they buy the trust, they buy the reassurance, they buy, a, if you like, uh, the safety thing, you know, in case I'm stranded, I know that British Airways will pull me out. You know, it's just an you know, insurance kind of investment. So we need to understand that. You know, so inciting customers by giving them physical attributes and giving them service attributes and hoping that uh, they're going to be loyal for the rest of their lives to you maybe is a, 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 a narrow-minded perspective, you know. We need to broaden the perspective. And I think that this new evolving uh, science or field um, is going to uh, really be important in the future. And here is really a chart that uh, explains what I'm saying. If you remember, in the old days, if you look at the x-axis, you know, we measure value from a tangible perspective, money point of view. 
But with um, 21st century, the value is really what does it do to the customer's emotions? Does it generate attachment? Does it generate loyalty? It may not be revenue-based, but it will be loyalty-based. So we need to accept that. The other thing is the differentiation aspects. Now, I know that some of you who do marketing here, you still uh, do Porter and you still do you know, product differentiation, whatever it is. And I hope that you don't just do it by looking at the old-fashioned perspective of uh, commodity-based businesses or even uh, product and service-based uh, businesses, the tangible side. You know? The growth now is uh, you differentiate on creating experiences, unique experiences. If I have 20 first-class passengers, how can I give each one of them a different experience? Not by tempering with much of what I have. I may have the same seat, the same 80% menu, and everything else is 80%. The 20% is what I can fiddle with, what I can customize with. That's smart. You know? So you leverage economies of scale, you create economies of scope, and you have got that margin where you can invest in one-to-one -one relationships. The 80-20 rule is really the the one that we underplay at the moment. We don't really use it in a smart way. This is the, uh, the Nike, uh, for example, drive in the 21st century. They're saying, you know, by emphasizing the brand, we really create experience for the customer. You know, you go and ask a teenager now, why don't you buy that pair of uh, trainers? Because it's 30% cheaper than a Nike and they will give you a lecture because they will tell you, you know, what Nike is. You know, you go and say to somebody, why don't you buy that T-shirt instead of buying that? Because you will save 50% and they will give you an education, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The attachment to brands is the emotional attachment. When somebody puts on a Nike uh, pair of trainers, they feel whom they want to feel. When somebody wears a swatch, watch on Saturday night, they feel who they want to feel, right? Um, and etc, etc. So when somebody sits in a Starbucks and has a Starbucks, they're not drinking coffee, are they? Don't know what they're doing, but they are sitting at Starbucks. So they're creating an experience. This is real. You know, this is real. Even if you are traditional, you know, you have to pay attention to those things. So the customer drives. Quality in the 21st century is driven quality. It is about creating experiences. It is the notion of PLC. All what we can do is put the options in front of the customer, give them the raw materials, and let them pull what they want out of it. First class passenger, the only thing that may, they may want is, give me some shades and some socks, please, and don't disturb me. But can you do me a favor? wake me up 45 minutes before we land. To them, that's experience. They have experienced a nice, long, uninterrupted sleep, you know, in the comfort of their seat, and they have been walking in a gentle way, you know, with a nice, fresh orange juice being presented to them, and they will say, wow, and they pay 5,000 pounds, okay? You can laugh, Liam, Liam, but that's what happens. Or they can say, I'm sitting here now, this is a journey of a lifetime, I have saved for four years to fly wherever I want to fly and keep me entertained for the next seven hours, please, you know? So the trolley is up and down, the attention is up and down, you know, they're pampered, they're experiencing. But they are pulling, aren't they? Because they are saying, give me another film, this, was, this is no good. I'm still hungry, can you get me some snacks? Uh, can you replenish my drink, please, and can you do that? And all of this is a customer pull. We do it if you like, without thinking about it. But that's what quality is. It's not take it, one size fits all, you know, uh, no negotiation. Michael Dell said it himself. He says, we believe that the quality and nature of the customer relationship and experience is going to be the next competitive b battleground. I mean, how can we customize? How can we take you as an audience, and you are a large audience, for example, at the School of Management, and say, how can we provide basic uh, education to all of you? Because 
those are the essentialities that you need to know before you go back to work, so to speak. But how can we cater for individual needs? You all come from different services and different industries and have different needs and different expectations, whatever. So the one-to-one, -one, the 20% that I'm talking about, which really is about scoping and zooming in on one-to-one -one and getting you to pull some of the things that you want that may not be on offer in the catalogue, and if we can do that, you're going to really uh, have that experience that you will uh, cherish for the rest of your life, and you're going to talk about, and that's really brand attachment, because you talk about it. So, um, I hope you can see what this uh, in search of excellence means. It means, first of all, that we redefine excellence. We really make it contemporary. We really link it to the real world, the world that we live in now. If we have biases, if we have suppositions about what the real world is, and if we don't have a common vision, a common understanding of what the future might look like, then my lecture is not going to help any of you. But I covered a lot of ground to bring all of us, hopefully, to a common ground so that we can move forward. And I think um, uh, in order to understand uh, some of the other tensions uh, that are happening, um, the real world now, or the global e economic world, is not really what it used to be before. I think you can see at a glance the economies that are growing significantly are no longer, if you like, the, the economies of the West. China has come onto the scene very late, and China has taken the world by storm. You can see that chart. Although it says 1990 to 2000, it hasn't really uh, come down after 2000. China is dominant. It's a frightening perspective for the rest of the world, what might happen in the next 20 years or so. So we need to pay attention to that. We also need to pay attention to the fact that, um, you know, maybe the global business is a cyclical business. Japan have their days. Uh, Japan is facing a lot of challenging. Germany is facing a lot of uh, challenges. The rest of Europe is as well. The U.S. has started to face some serious, serious challenges. If you look at um, consumer and the purchasing power, for example, and again, this chart tells you from 1995 to 2020 as a projection, the purchasing power parity has shifted. China will have abundance it will have consumer power, you know, because the economy is providing generously for all of those people who live in China or uh, who have interface with uh, uh, Chinese economy. Look at that compared to the United States, uh, which will still be a strong economy, uh, but will have less purchasing power than China. India, um, surprisingly, is a very, very powerful economy. And, um, you know, if I was living in India now, I would think twice about emigrating to the West because in the next 10, 15 years, I would, I would, I would be able to command, if you like, salaries which are four times the salaries of, uh, you can laugh, you're going back to India, mate. <laughs> um, you know, and that is a shift that we must understand. The world is no longer the world that we lived through in the 20th century, you know? We must accept that, you know, it's gonna change. And I'm gonna just show you uh, very quickly, I'm not an economist, but I mean, when you see a graph going like mad like this, it tells you something is happening. Uh, Indian share prices, um, you know, that's India, the map. Um, these figures are telling you everything is growing in India, population is growing, uh, gross domestic product is growing and continues to grow, prediction 2010. The export is interesting. The blue peaks here are saying that uh, the balance of trade of India is a very, very healthy one. I mean, don't worry about these little red peaks because they were worse before. Um, uh, so an economy which is growing is an economy which is also consuming. So the, as long as your exports are higher than your imports, uh, then, you know, uh, you're doing okay. But, um, um, you, you know, and again, Loads of nice graphs that you can see. GDP growth is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is on the up. 
foreign exchange reserves um, on the up, fixed assets investment on the up. I mean, loads of, uh, you can see the trends. Call centers are going to India. Manufacturing bases are closing in the West and going to India. Um, if you look at the Silicon Valley, you know, um, in, in the States more or less, that's a cemetery there. Go to India and you see in Bangalore and places like that, really thriving industry, developing software for the future in all. So that is what is going on. In China, the same thing. Although if you look at China, China, I think the economy, we're still scratching at the surface. Because if you look at, um, uh, if you like, purchasing power or GDP per capita, uh, there's a lot of yellow, isn't there, left. A lot of Chinese are still below the poverty line according to our standards. More people now um, are earning uh, better money, but that trend is going to continue. As the economy grows and provides with abundance, people will get better jobs, people will be pumped more, and I think that uh, you know, the standard of living is going to go up because the GDP per capita is going to grow significantly. And again, you can see these graphs and these trends telling you uh, what is going on with the Chinese um, economy. Interesting here um, how they are depending less and less on agriculture and the growth in industry and the service industry, the red peaks and the blue peaks um, you know, are, are on the increase. So China as an economy is going to be the global manufacturing base of the world but also it's intending to become the global service base of the world. Okay, um, and less and less reliance is going to be on traditional uh, agriculture. Okay, so um, uh, we can park this uh, uh, argument. So, <clears throat> so that's I, ha I have said a lot, um, uh, and um, um, I have told you what's the tensions that are happening in the global economy. But one thing which is important that quality has provided, which should not be um, gone unnoticed. This theme about sustainable growth, sustainable performance, I think it's, first of all, it's important to understand that quality does not really impact on bottom line only. Quality is an investment into the health of the organization. It creates, if you like, the mesh, it creates the, the fabric that can sustain uh, an organization in bad times or can help it, if you like, stretch itself when things are going well for it. Um, uh, I mentioned these 26 organizations in Japan over 20 years. They still exist. They still do business. They're still healthy. They still outperform their key competitors. That's what quality is about. So uh, what do we mean by uh, sustainable growth? Um, it's really the rate of growth that really creates the biggest returns to shareholders and beyond. So you grow organically or you go in such a fashion without impeding, if you like, uh, the internal um, organs, uh, if I can call them organs, without jeopardizing the health and delivering, if you like, uh, sustainable growth. Okay, let's look at it more closely. This is from Deloitte, their recent survey, uh, and they say um, uh, it's the maximum pace at which we can grow revenue without depleting our financial resources. So you can give the impression that you're growing. I mean, for example, uh, growth through acquisitions, growth through stripping and selling, growth through reliant, uh, reliance on outsourcing, the different strategies for growing a business. You know? So you seemingly show that uh, you, you know, you're growing the revenue base, but in terms of sustainability, uh, you know, that could be an issue. So it's really enablers driving the results. The enablers are the capabilities that you build which can uh, sustain you. Uh, the bottom bit there says how you calculate it. I mean, those of you who are interested in, in that because you, your background is finance or whatever. So you multiply the return on equity by the company's earnings. This is interesting. It's earnings retention rate. So um, it's the maximum is one, so it's one minus the dividend uh, payout ratio, you know? So that's the retention uh, side. Uh, no need to bother with that, except to say that the Deloitte report 
concluded that um, sustainable growth can enable management and shareholders to benchmark the company's performance against its potential and to better allocate its resources. Because uh, part of the reasons why we've got governance issues and we've got tensions, if you like, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Western um, public limited companies is because the emphasis, first of all, is on, on short term, but on sustainable returns as well. So, you, you know, how can you build reserves? How can you build uh, the, the residue, if you, if you like, that will carry you long term? And quality does stop you from making um, that mistake because it emphasizes on the intangible. So if you use, for example, the balance scorecard, it tells you how important to measure the financials, but also it tells you how, how important it is to focus on the customer, how to measure customer satisfaction, how to deal with complaints. But the balance scorecard also tells you how you should look at organizational learning and improvement, how you look at people their growth, intellectual capital. And also it tells you about the hard side, which is process, efficiency, productivity, uh, optimization measures, and those kind of measures. So by getting you to invest in the uh, non-financial performance uh, aspects, in a way, has helped you uh, go towards the sustainable growth. You know? And GE will never have a problem you know, um, uh, all the winners of the Baldrige Award, all the winners of the European Excellence Award will not have a problem because they use, uh, if you like, uh, monitoring devices that prompt them towards the capability side, i.e. the non-financial uh, performance side. So sustainable growth means that it may not be an absolute measure. It's an elusive and priced business endeavor. It means that in search of more excellence, really the title of the presentation tonight. And it means that it's really a, a behavioral mindset that helps you with uh, when things are going well, but also th when things are difficult. So when things are going well, it's how do you um, replenish and increase the viability of your business towards all those stakeholders, the markets, the customers, the community, and so on. But when things go badly, is how can you use uh, those strengths basically that you have to continue to interface with your stakeholders in the priority order, but to help you get some breath back, i.e. Uh, to, uh, uh, to overcome those challenges. Do, do, do you understand that? So it's like an athlete who is very strong, you know, uh, when he is lean and fit and, and everything else, he can clock the time that he wants to clock. But sometimes... Uh, when, you know, when the, and he can race every day of the week, but when, he, when the fitness is down, he's got the strength, the mental strength, the training and everything else. He may say, okay, I don't have the energy basically to run four times this week. I will only do it twice, but because he's preserving, building the energy level that will help him to achieve that result. So it's that kind of interface. Uh, that is what sustainable growth is about. Why is it important from the point of view of quality? It's really to make sure we exist, to have enough resource to continue to, to deal with demands from our customers and the market and so on and so forth. And to continue to grow, not just, uh, as I said, in terms of uh, delivery to the shareholders, but numbers, um, strength, positioning, the brand and everything else. Now, I was going to show you a video clip, but I'm not going to do now, which really deals with this argument here because this argument is saying that if you want to achieve sustainable growth as a business you must really have a set of metrics or measures that will cover the holistic perspective of enterprise which look well beyond just the financial statements okay and uh, so I'm gonna skip that uh, Glenn you don't need to come and rescue me and companies are in the dark, as the survey said, because their attention is too heavily focused on traditional financial performance. That video clip I was going to show you is me speaking to a large number of uh, executives at ICL in 1996, okay? And the message was exactly the same 10 years ago. So nothing has changed. We are still driven by short-term uh, goals. We still have 
if you like, the financial institutions driving the performance of businesses. We're not allowing businesses to build enough strength, basically, to cope with adverse times. Some companies have done it because they've done it out of belief. If you remember IBM in 1990, for the first time in the whole history of IBM, when they went in the red, everybody said, obviously, uh, a lot of executives had to be sacrificed and had to, be, uh, to leave the business. And the incoming team, everybody was betting on them going back to basics, i.e., go back to the financials, bring the accountants in and get rid of quality, get rid of this fluffy stuff. When the new chairman and his team came um, to rescue the business, his first statement was, thank God for quality. Because if it wasn't for quality, IBM would have been in a worse situation. And because of that, IBM bounced back within a year. Within a year, they were back in business, back in profit, back in competition, because quality was a cushion for them. It has helped them to absorb basically that shock and to basically re re regroup and uh, use their inner strengths to compete again. And I think that uh, we still, unfortunately, don't understand the importance of that. And um, there is a lot um, uh, of, um, um, of work that needs to be done. Um, I was going to show you this, but uh, because of time, I'm going to skip it. Um, but we have next week as well, remember? And we have the week after and the week after and we have after. Um, so um, uh, um, I was going to give you an example of what is going on in Singapore, what is going on in Japan, and what are the challenges according to this American Society for Quality uh, study. Uh, but I'm going to stop here because um, uh, you've been very attentive and it's been two hours and uh, normally we don't uh, let you listen for two hours. Um, and uh, before we break and have um, a sandwich and you know, give you the chance to um, take a breather, if you have any questions uh, you want to ask me, I'll be happy um, to answer them, please.